welcome to this panel discussion on working towards the inclusion of a plant-based diet in public policy. It's going to be a really exciting and informative afternoon and it's wonderful to have our speakers and of course all of you um, wonderful um, guests with us today. Before we start, I'd like to just introduce myself. My name is Dr. Shireen Kassam and I'll be facilitating this panel discussion. I'm a medical doctor and have been working in the National Health Service in the UK for the past 22 years. I'm also passionate, passionate about the role of plant-based diets in clinical practice for both personal and planetary health. I provide education and advocacy on plant-based diets through my non-profit organisation, Plant-Based Health Professionals UK, which is a member organisation of Plant Europe, and also through my work at the University of Winchester, where I run an accredited course on plant-based nutrition for healthcare professionals. I've been working with my own hospital to try and change the food environment to one that is more plant-based and sustainable. So I am really excited to hear from our speakers today about including plant-based diets into public policy. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to spending the next couple of hours with you. Um, before we get going, just a technical note for all of you in the audience. Um, your Zoom screen is currently set up in speaker view while we're listening to the presentations. And then when we start the panel, you'll be able to see everyone in the gallery view. Um, so wonderful. So um, we're really excited to start off with a keynote speech from Dr. From Dr. Frederic Vellin, aide at the German Federal Ministry of Food and Agriculture. The ministry has spent the last 11 months working on the German national food strategy. Um, so over to you, Frederic. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for inviting me to this event on working towards the inclusion of a plant-based diet in public policy. At the moment, hardly a week goes by without some discussions taking place. After all, there's a lot of work to be done. I'm delighted to have the opportunity today to address important food and nutrition policy topics with you. We are currently working flat out on the federal government's food and nutrition strategy. In so doing, we are implementing a mandate from the coalition agreement, also we do also have a societal remit in this respect. Food affects both our health and our well-being, but how and what we eat also has a direct impact on the preservation of our natural resources, on our environment, on biodiversity, and on the climate in Germany and worldwide, and on animals. BMEL has taken the lead in drafting the federal gov government's food and nutrition strategy in a wide ranging participatory process. The key objectives of the food and nutrition strategy are a more plant-based diet, a further reduction in the consumption of sugar, fat and salt, the, the creation of socially just access to a sustainable diet, the promotion of the range of sustainable and organic food, the reduction of food waste and the promotion of mass catering with a higher share of seasonal, regional and organic food. The transformation of the entire food system towards a plant-based diet true to sustainable organic principles is the most important lever in the food sector for achieving our national and international climate, biodiversity and sustainability goals. Away from home catering and more particularly mass catering is an important starting point for the sustainable revamping of the food and nutrition environment, for instance, in nurseries, schools, canteens. Mass catering can help to reduce food waste and achieve the target of 30% organically farmed land by 2030, and it can promote the sale of organic, seasonal and regional produce. Against this backdrop, it must be clear that fundamental changes are dependent on considerable joint efforts. We are all called on to take action, policymakers, business circles, and civil society too. That is also why we are drafting this food and nutrition strategy together with all the major stakeholders. The drafting of the food and nutrition strategy is very demanding in terms of content time and procedure. It's not a pure stakeholder process. Since it is a strategy of the federal government, 
agreement must also be reached within the interministerial steering group. Nonetheless, we wish to develop the food and nutrition strategy together with the stakeholders. To this end, we carried out a transparent participatory process during the first stage of drafting the strategy between June 2022 and February this year. At the same time, based on the key issue paper pathway to the federal government's food and nutrition strategy, the interministerial group reached agreement on the thematic and procedural guidelines. During this participatory process, several events were staged and a broad online survey was conducted. In June last year, we launched a process with the digital kickoff event attended by around 150 participants. In October last year, Together with the Federal Center of Food and Nutrition, we forged a bridge between topic area five of the National Dialogue on the UN Food System Summit on the food and nutrition strategy and discussed the subject of a plant-based diet with over 160 participants. Theme-based workshops were held in January and February last year, uh, this year, during which 189 participating organizations worked on proposals for measures for the food and nutrition strategy. The contributions and results of the workshops are currently being evaluated by BMEL and will then be incorporated into the ongoing international drafting of the strategy. The interministerial steering group will then hold consultations on the strategy. We want to place the food and nutrition strategy on holistic foundations in order to improve dietary environments by means of comprehensive approach. What is needed here is a systemic approach consisting of behavioral and setting-based prevention measures that take into account the effects on the environment, the climate, and also on the different living environments and link up the individual topics. To this end, the federal government's food and nutrition strategy should consist of several phases and timelines up to 2050 and should define short, medium and long term strategic, strategic food and nutrition policy priorities, areas of action and their respective goals, set out concrete measures and point out effective ways of achieving these goals. Thank you very much for your attention. I wish you every success and fruitful discussions during today's event. Great, thank you very much for your really interesting overview and essential work that you're doing. So I'm just going to kick off with a few words about the project itself. The Plant Europe Network connects pioneers from the field of plant-based nutrition across Europe to support and accelerate the transformation of the food system. The Plant Europe Network provides a website with helpful information, studies and tools. There's also a growing community that's been created so that users can connect directly with each other. In addition, two reports will be produced during the project timeline, one on political strategies and instruments on how to promote plant-based food in Europe, and the other on best practices and diverse approaches in European countries. The Plant Europe team is also conducting a total of three online panel discussions on different topics within the framework of the project. Today's panel discussion is the second of three, and we are joined by pioneers from different European countries who will be given the space to share their success stories today, thus enabling knowledge transfer and exchange of experiences. Transformation towards sustainable food systems is a key challenge of our time. As food production and consumption have major environmental impacts and are linked to health-related challenges, food policies have become a vital component of the realisation of the Sustainable Development Goals. Given the growing demand for plant-based meals and the benefits they offer, it is imperative that state-level policies are developed and implemented to facilitate this shift towards a more sustainable and equitable food system. While civil society campaigns have helped raise awareness about the benefits of a plant-based diet, it is now the task of political decision makers to take steps and create the necessary regulatory frameworks and infrastructure to support this shift at a broader scale. By working together with stakeholders from all sectors, policymakers can help create a more sustainable and equitable food system that benefits both individuals and the planet. Some countries and initiatives are leading the way in including a plant-based diet in their 
public policy. Today, we will learn why and how they have gone down their individual paths and what other countries and actors can learn from them. We will hear from Anne Envelston how the Danish dietary guidelines encourage people to eat less meat and more legumes to protect their health as well as the planet. Jerome Remmers from the Netherlands will tell us about the need for a carbon dioxide tax in Europe. Kevan Mostavavi from France is going to share insights into the French advances on a plant-based diet and community setting. We will hear from Dustin Benton from my country, the United Kingdom, who will share lessons learned from the UK's national food strategy. And then finally, we will hear about Thursday Veggie Day in Ghent, presented by Sophie Van Sophie Hooven um, from um, Belgium. So thank you very much. I'm just going to share my screen um, just to give you some further instructions um, on using Zoom this afternoon. So I hope you can see my um, screen. Um, and just really to remind you that you can use the chat function to introduce yourselves and, and tell us who you are, where you've come from. Please post your questions um, to, uh, for the panel discussion at the end in the Q&A function. You can vote um, for the questions you want to be answered um, in order. Um, and you can also, if possible, if you could um, let me know who the question is addressed to from the panel. Um, and then um, we will um, be taking your um, questions and you're going to be welcome to raise your hand and um, unmute and, and speak your questions when the time comes. Um, so I will um, firstly, let me just um, stop sharing my screen. Great, we'll be back to the main function now. So, um, and just a reminder that we'll be recording this and this recording will be made um, available to the wider public um, in, in the days coming after this panel discussion. So we're going to first start with Anne Envelston from the Danish Food Administration, who's going to talk to us about developing the Danish dietary guidelines. The development process was initiated in 2020 and was led by the Danish Veterinary and Food Administration, who were responsible for the process. For the first time ever, Denmark's official dietary guidelines published in January 2021 do not only guide Danes on how to eat healthier, but also on how to eat more climate friendly. So over to you, Anne. Well, thank you so much for the invitation, and uh, I'm so happy uh, to have the chance to share our experiences uh, and learnings from our work with developing new food-based dietary guidelines and also how we work with implementing these guidelines. Here you see our official uh, Danish dietary guidelines, uh, which we pronounce good for health and climate. The guidelines look uh, a lot like the former ones, since a lot of what is good for your health is also good for the climate. But of course, we have made some changes. Um, we have, um, of course, integrated the climate perspective. We went from 10 to 7 guidelines. We went from talking about nutrients to talk about foods, uh, and that actually did a huge difference. And uh, as you can see, I've highlighted what is mostly new to the public, and that is that we recommend to eat plant rich, we recommend to eat less meat, and we recommend to choose legumes. And also in our communication, we've been focusing a lot on the journey, so to speak, not the goal, but start wherever you are and work on eating less meat, more legumes, and do not focus uh, as much as the exact goal. As Shireen said, um, our um, development process was initiated back in 2020. And as you see here to the right, you can see uh, the work that, uh, that we based our, uh, the report that we based our work on, and it's the Guidance for Sustainable uh, Healthy Diets, which was uh, published by the Danish National Food Institute back in 2020. Uh, here, the Danish researchers developed a Danish model diet based on the global Eat Lancers uh, reference diet. And in addition, the evidence report behind the previous di dietary guidelines from 2013 
and the Nordic Nutrition Recommendations from 2012 was uh, also included in our work. And last but not least, the development process also took the current Danish eating habits and the Danish food culture into considerations. And here you see the process, or well, this slide might indicate a rather smooth development process leading from one step to another. I have to admit that this was not at all like, uh, like that in reality, but this is how it looked like in the big picture. As, as you can see, we um, involved stakeholders in two different workshops. We also did a consumer uh, survey and we did a pretest campaign to make sure that everybody understood what we were talking about. Our workshop with the stakeholders uh, are very controlled. We seldom tell them to find something to agree on. We want all the perspectives. It helps us, it teaches us, and we learn from it. And it gives us a very good picture of the position of our stakeholders, and that's very helpful afterwards. In our workshops, we focus on how to communicate, we focus on the wording, we never go into details about the evidence, we leave that to our National Food Institute. I think that's very important to stress here. And of course, through this process, we have had an ongoing dialogue with researchers at the Technical University. We have had tons of internal discussions, tests, new drafts, et cetera. And we have put a lot of effort into the wording. And that's actually why we are talking about plant-rich diets and not plant-based diets. When we launched the... Um, the guidelines, we sort of had, well, one set of food-based dietary guidelines and we sort of have two different perspectives. On one hand, we had a lot of reactions to telling us, you must be out of your mind advising no more than 350 grams of meat per week. It is so wrong of you to combine climate and health and those guidelines won't change anything after all. That was one hand. On the other hand, we also had a lot of reactions telling us that, oh, these are easy guidelines, they are easy to follow. And finally, you're combining health, climate and food. Why haven't you done that uh, sooner? And we also had voices telling us that we were a bit unambitious, uh, since we're still guiding for a small amount of, of meat in, the, in a weekly diet. And that sort of told us that we might have hit a reasonable spot in between, something that works with our food culture and that is also ambitious according to health and uh, climate. We have, of course, had a lot, faced a lot of challenges uh, along our way. We had to integrate the focus of climate without compromising the health aspects. We have had to tackle the gap between food culture and what is a climate-friendly diet, especially according to the meat and the legumes. Uh, and we've also faced uh, a very, very small interest and motivation among uh, health professionals in order to work with these guidelines. They sort of wanted to get back to the good old uh, food-based dietary guidelines that were only advising on health. But we have uh, sticked to our new guidelines and we sort of think that it is uh, leading the way here in Denmark. So what have we learned so far? We've learned that it works to talk about food instead of nutrients. It's easier for consumers to understand. We've learned that our stakeholders make a difference in both the development process, but also in the communication and the implementation afterwards, since they've sort of been part of the development process. And that's a huge motivation to help us bring out the guidelines to the public and also to work with the guidelines uh, in uh, the organizations of our stakeholders. We've also experienced that the climate agenda has brought our new, us new friends and that the discussion regarding the guidelines has shifted from a more technical level to a more ideological level. And we find that um, uh, very uh, positive. Um, in our work with implementing these guidelines and communicating, we've had uh, a mantra saying no one can do it all, but everybody can do something. And this more inclusive tone makes our messages uh, far more acceptable. And it's also more easy for us as a government to be in, uh, in challenging uh, discussions because we can talk about the journey and not the end goal all the time. 
we, when we launched the guidelines, we had a minister who was really in it, and that was a huge win for the guidelines and, and the set off for, for this work with a more climate and plant rich uh, diet. And also we have learned that these guidelines can really work as a strategic tool for the development of a whole food sector, since these guidelines are the, the reference point for everything we're talking about when we talk about how to develop the food system uh, in Denmark. Here you see our implementation strategy. And as you can see, we have like three tracks. We have our communication track where we work with, of course, campaigns. We did a launching campaign last year. We did a song. We had four students uh, giving us a song and we made a music video and published it. And in, it uh, went viral. And it was another way of talking about these uh, guidelines. And we have these always on activities, unfolding the guidelines. For example, we show how much 30 grams of nuts are. We are doing myth busting. Um, we developed a dietary circle and uh, we also filed in together with a group of stakeholders, a report re advising the government to develop a, a new climate label. And that's, that work is about to start. We also work a lot uh, with structural changes since that's also um, a way to get all the way through to all kinds of consumers. We have uh, developed guide, dietary guidelines for kindergarten schools and canteen. We have de developed educational material and we work a lot into public procurement since that's, uh, I won't exactly call it easy, but it's a more smooth and notching way to implement part of uh, the dietary guidelines into professional kitchens. And last but not least, we work a lot with partnerships. Uh, since here we find that we can have partners to work on real changes, like uh, with reformulation, new products, notching, and we support uh, these initiatives within our partners with the communication, uh, legalization, et cetera. So does it work? Well, I can't say that we uh, reached our goal already after two years. Um, we do a yearly survey on the knowledge of the dietary guidelines. We ask consumers, do you know them? How, how often do you think you follow each advice and how hard do you find or easy do you find the advice to, to follow? And those answers are racing, but we're not facing 100% yes. So there is still a work to do. Our National Food Institute monitors Danish eating habits, but they only do it every 10 years. So it's rather difficult to see if, if the dietary guidelines have actually had a, an impact yet on our eating habits. And we also follow yearly sales statistics through our partnerships to see, um, well, we can't tell what you eat because you have a lot of food waste, but we can, we can tell what, you, what you're buying. And, and I have to say there is still room for improvement, but um, we're working on it. And we believe that, that the, there is a certain momentum right now with the, the whole food, food system being aware of this new agenda. Um, we also experienced that we have very few, if any, easy wins, but that's uh, only motivating us to work even harder on gaining more healthy and more plant-rich and climate-friendly eating habits in, uh, in Denmark. Thank you for your, your attention. Thank you very much, Anne. It's really inspiring work. And I look forward to the day when the UK is following along the same lines and incorporating sustainability into newer guidelines. So really given us all quite a lot of inspiration. Um, I'd delight to, uh, to introduce our next speaker, Jérôme Hemmers um, from the Netherlands. His organization, the True Animal Protein Price Coalition, works together um, to affect policy measures aimed to lower meat consumption and dairy consumption by introducing fair prices for meat and dairy products, including environmental and other costs. Um, so over to you, Jerome. Thank you very much. Uh, I will share my screen. Um, yes, I hope you can see it now. Um, yeah. So first, some words about my organization. Uh, we founded it uh, four years ago, and now we have 60 partners coming from different backgrounds like farmers, youth groups, environmental and animal welfare groups, uh, doctors, etc. 
uh, we represent a lot of people and um, um, two years ago we also uh, had an action with uh, over 5,000 companies and NGOs who supported a letter to uh, presidents of the 50 countries who eat uh, most meat asking them to to introduce carbon pricing of meat and dairy um, so um, what do we do we we publish reports and uh, we do policy advocacy in the EU and in EU member states we are also active in UN climate conferences and we do some catering projects in the Netherlands to, to really implement the high uh, meat price and in the same time reduce uh, prices of uh, vegan meals and, and vegetables and fruits. And this was really successful in three universities. Um, so we um, published uh, two uh, reports from CE Delft on how to tax uh, meat and also dairy and eggs. This was the last report uh, this, uh, this year. And um, we also had some uh, events at uh, EU level um, where we presented our proposals. Um, and there was a vote at EU Parliament um, also, uh, which uh, supported our proposals. So what was the Dutch success? Uh, so uh, our government uh, um, supported our proposal and they studied how to do it. And they're still <laughs> doing it, uh, to be honest. Uh, because some final details have to be uh, find out and there is some resistance uh, also in our parliament, uh, but there is some support for it. Um, and some supermarkets are also now uh, making decisions on, on having uh, higher prices for livestock farmers who, who have more uh, sustainability uh, um, goals. Um, so what is, how, how can you explain the success so that, that I think we are a coalition of many different groups who all uh, support um, our, our goal. Um, and this makes us uh, stronger, of course, and um, we have uh, credible science based policy proposals. We prove uh, by surveys uh, that we represent the majority of the consumers in the Netherlands, but also in France and in uh, Germany. We have a good presence in the media um, and uh, good contact with political parties and some support of ambassadors. Um, so the theory behind our work is the true price principle. Uh, this is based on environmental costs, but also on social costs like uh, uh, health costs and also the fair price for farmers and, and animal, uh, animal welfare costs. And the basic idea is uh, that uh, in the end, the, the sorry, the 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 food products uh, will be a li little bit more expensive, but uh, the, the 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 external cost, the true price gap, is reduced. So society will not pay any more uh, huge cost for health and and environment and greenhouse gases. Um, uh, the EU farm to fork strategy was published two years ago. The Green Deal for food and we lobbied for it, and so we hoped that the tax on meat would be mentioned there, but this was not so. But the principle was accepted that uh, true prices uh, should be applied uh, in the EU tax systems and in food prices. So, so it should reflect the, the, true, uh, the environmental cost. And it was also said uh, we eat too much meat and, and we need uh, to, to, to stop the low meat prices, selling meat at really low prices. And the code of conduct for supermarkets was proposed, but um, and if the co code of conduct will not work properly, then legislation would follow. This was uh, uh, pro proposed in the farm to fork strategy. So now we are on the phase that we need this legislation, and we hope this will come this autumn. Um, as I said, uh, there was a vote in the EU Parliament uh, two years ago. Uh, um, and uh, there a large majority supported the idea of a zero fat rate on healthy uh, food products like vegetables and fruits and the highest uh, fat rate on the food with negative impacts on health and environment. So meat, of course, should be one of those products. But the problem is that EU uh, governments uh, from the member states have to implement it. So now I tell you about the Ipsos survey we did uh, a few months ago. And it showed that there is a, a majority of about 60% uh, in the three countries uh, we examined uh, the, who support the, the different proposals. 
that on the one hand, uh, meat and dairy should uh, have a higher price and in the same time, uh, healthy and sustainable food products uh, should have a lower price, for instance, by having a zero fat rate on, on it or other kinds of uh, subsidies. Uh, so this was really uh, nice to see, and uh, it was a representative uh, survey. So it's really what, what people want. Um, for instance, our own proposal, which is a higher price of meat of 40% uh, higher price on average, was also supported, but on the condition that uh, the healthy food uh, will become cheaper and also farmers will be uh, uh, will benefit from extra subsidies for sustainable production and low income groups are compensated. Um, we also found that people want uh, supermarkets and consumers to pay for greenhouse gas emission uh, costs because now uh, the, the yeah, livestock and, and supermarkets are the only sector in the EU who, who, who don't uh, uh, pay for greenhouse gas emissions. All other sectors have to pay for it and, or will pay in the future. Um, but um, some say the farmers have to do it, but most consumers uh, think it's fair that supermarkets and, and, and consumers pay in the end. Um, yeah, this is another proposal that, that food on average can become cheaper if a combination of, of both policies uh, can be combined and, and uh, people also receive free food vouchers for healthy and sustainable food to compensate for, for a lower, uh, higher cost uh, for, for, for meat and dairy. But on average, uh, food can become 10% cheaper if you do it in this way. Um, so, yeah, we know that uh, th th this proposal is supported, we know it's feasible, we know it's supported by the EU Parliament, so now we are just waiting for the member states to implement it. And the calculation model behind this, uh, our, our tax levels, is, is that we uh, have a look to greenhouse gas emissions, nitrogen and particulate matter and biodiversity loss. And we calculate the, 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 the environmental damage cost per kilogram product for different uh, meat types like beef, dairy, and, and uh, uh, chicken meat. Other factors which were not included in our tax proposal is uh, also health cost per kilogram red meat. But we uh, made a study this year on a healthcare cost per kilogram red meat and processed meat, and this is really very high as well. So this should be actually on top of the, our tax proposal based on environmental costs. Other costs like living wages for farmers were not included as well. So these are our two reports. You can see it on our website, uh, tabcoalition.eu. Um, and this was the main proposal uh, that in 2030, uh, food prices for meat uh, will increase on average with 40%, but for beef, it will be more because there are more environmental costs uh, related to it. And it will uh, uh, realize uh, a, a reduction of 50% of meat consumption. And again, for beef, this is higher compared to chicken meat. Um, we also made a proposal for, for um, uh, uh, dairy and, and egg and uh, some milk and cheese. So how much uh, would, uh, would the tax on these products look like in Europe? And this is the result. So we need uh, uh, really higher prices on it. And this will uh, really help to, to, uh, to a consumption pattern in line with dietary guidelines. It will reduce healthcare costs. It will reduce greenhouse gas emissions with 3% in Europe if all European countries would do it. So it's really important also for the Paris climate uh, goals. If we don't do it, uh, taxing meat and dairy, we will not realize our Paris climate goals. We will not realize the, the zero deforestation goals. We, it's, and we will not realize our health goals. This is my uh, uh, opinion, but it's also based on science. So, um, <clears throat> What can we do to prevent that uh, low income groups are harmed by this proposal? So we want to use uh, a large part of the tax revenues uh, to, to recycle it towards uh, cheaper, uh, healthy and sustainable food. And we, in, on top of this, we can also pay extra money to the lowest income groups to compensate them. 
for instance, with 10 euros per month. It could, could be money or food vouchers, or, or but uh, money would be the best. And um, it's also proven that if you tax um, meat and dairy, but on the same time, uh, a zero fat rate on vegetables, fruits, bread, and cereals is applied, that people will be net benefiters. Um, so yeah, this so there is no need to compensate those income groups because everybody will benefit. Um, how did we deal with difficulties? Uh, there were some attacks from the farmer community, but farmers are also in our coalitions. Um, there were some uh, attacks from our largest uh, right-wing newspaper, but uh, later the, this uh, newspaper published also a, a large article which was positive, so they now accept us. And um, there were attacks from the meat lobby. They continue, but um, we, we tell we represent what the majority wants. And there were two political parties in our government who were not really convinced, <laughs> uh, but we also work on different ways to, to include them as well. And uh, the meat prices are very high because of food inflation. And this, this is a problem because politicians are not really uh, liking to, to in even increase the prices more. But uh, we tell uh, this is what, what needs to happen and food inflation is going down again. So the, with a uh, backlash, uh, we had a, a majority vote uh, last year in our parliament uh, against the meat tax. So this was not very nice, but we continue to develop alternative proposals which are supported by a, a political majority. Um, <clears throat> So this is the way uh, we deal with it. And uh, there are some good examples of Denmark and New Zealand who already decided to introduce taxes on, on meat and, and dairy because greenhouse gas emissions will be part of the tax uh, system. Um, and other countries have um, implemented some forms of fat reform and the EU commission is really preparing also a tax uh, ETS system for livestock emissions in 2026. Uh, and finally, yesterday we had our event in Germany where we presented our proposals. And I hope that um, mainly the EU will step forward and, and publish a framework for sustainable food systems this autumn, where some of our ideas are included. And um, we're also hopeful about Denmark and uh, maybe the Netherlands as well. De uh, Germany is, is, is difficult because uh, the finance minister is blocking uh, good proposals, which are supported by all other parties, by the way, <laughs> but he has the power to block. Um, maybe I skip this one, but you can read it later. But these are our proposals for the framework for the sustainable food uh, system law. And we heard that the polluter pays principle will be included there. And we, are, we hope that they will do it in a good way. And uh, yeah, we'll see it. Um, and we have a, a lot of other proposals done uh, towards the EU Commission uh, in um, March uh, this year. And uh, so we, we have to wait when it's published, but uh, we are hopeful. So um, yeah, this is um, my story. This, if, if some of you want uh, to, to join our coalition, you are welcome. Here's the information. Um, you are, uh, we can always work together, and I think together we can can really make this happen and make it a, real, a reality. So thank you for your attention. Great. Great. Thank you very much, Jerem. You've made uh, the case very strongly for an urgent and necessary change towards taxation for meat consumption. So thank you. Um, so next, we're going to hear a voice from civil society. Kayvan Mostafavi is a campaigner and in charge of the advocacy for the French NGO Assiette Végétale, whose focus at the moment is to help French collective catering to, to transition towards more plant-based meals. So over to you, Kayvan. Okay. Uh, just to say it's the first time for me doing such a presentation in English, and my English is not that good, so please be uh, indulgent. Um, yeah, so I'm going to uh, make an overview of the existing laws for vegetarian and plant-based dishes in uh, collective catering in France. Uh, so it's has been now um, 
five years uh, since the first law about it uh, have been voted. And uh, I think that there is some um, some knowledge that we can uh, gain from uh, this, uh, this story. So, uh, Asset Vegetal, uh, we are a non-profit organization um, for the moment working only in the collective catering sector in France. So I'm going to um, uh, explain a little bit more what is collective catering in, in France. And for doing that, we are doing political advocacy. Uh, we are also uh, highlighting the uh, best canteens that are doing already a lot of uh, plant-based meals uh, with our label, uh, Asiat Vert. We also do uh, event weeks in the in the canteens, and we also provide the training for, for chefs. And uh, here is a picture uh, of um, the, the day we gave our uh, green plate label uh, to a big um, organization that is in charge of uh, all the university canteens in a big region of France. And uh, now uh, we, we are working with them and now they are producing 50% uh, of uh, vegetarian meals uh, among their 3 million uh, meals in total. So it's, uh, there are some good victories that are, that are already happening in France. Uh, so today I'm going to speak first about uh, what is the collective catering sector in France, what are the existing laws about uh, vegetarian and plant-based meals in canteens, how did these laws uh, come to be? What are the challenges and the, the obstacles? Uh, are the laws applied? And finally, I'm going to uh, give some advices uh, if you want to advance uh, plant-based meals uh, in your country. So uh, the collective catering sector in France is uh, really a big thing. Um, in total, it's more than 3 billion meals a year. And um, the different canteens, um, are organized and are under the hierarchy of a very clear administration. So if you take, for example, the elementary school, uh, uh, it is the cities that are in charge. The high school, uh, it is other local collectivities, departments and regions, um, hospitals, prisons, universities. Uh, here, uh, the, the different ministries are in charge. And there is the private sector, so the, the collective canteens in companies, and then, of course, the companies who are in charge. Uh, so this sector is, uh, is big, and also um, it is interesting because of this clear uh, hierarchical division that uh, allows us, for example, Asset Vegetal, when we are talking to one collectivity, we are talking to uh, 100 uh, school canteens, so it allows us to do effective work. Um, and also a specificity in France, I guess, is that um, uh, you have these big uh, collective catering companies such as Sodexo or Elior, uh, but I think that they are a little bit less uh, big in France than there are in other countries. And for example, for the school canteens, uh, we think that 17% um, uh, of uh, the meals prepared in school canteens are prepared directly uh, by, by cooks. Uh, in the canteens and not by Sodexo or Elior, for example. So uh, what are the existing laws about uh, vegetarian meals in France? So I'm only going to talk about uh, vegetarian because there is no plant-based uh, in the law uh, for the moment. Uh, so um, in uh, 2018, uh, there was a first law and the, the wording of the law is interesting. Uh, that said, uh, during two years, the canteens have to make an experimentation of a vegetarian meal once a week. So it's, it was an experimentation and it was designed so that at the end of the two years, the government was going to make uh, some evaluation and see uh, if it wanted to continue this law. So it happened, the government made uh, this evaluation and uh, the evaluation was good. So uh, during the next law, the climate law in uh, 2021, uh, this weekly vegetarian menu, menu was made permanent. And also um, the law said explicitly, if you want to do every day uh, a vegetarian option, you can do it. Uh, so it's not mandatory, but you can do it if you want. And also the same law, the climate law said that for all the state run canteens, so uh, hospitals, uh, national administrations, uh, prisons, armies, 
uh, all these canteens have to do one vegetarian option every day. So it was a big, uh, big improvement. And uh, now we are going to see how this climate law, so I repeat, um, the vegetarian menu, the weekly vegetarian menu uh, made permanent in schools canteens and the daily vegetarian option in state-run state -run canteens, how uh, did this climate law uh, came to be? So first it was uh, the work of uh, many of the NGOs. Uh, I put here the name of the, the, the ones that I have mainly contributed and uh, especially Greenpeace and the French Vegetarian Association uh, had a big uh, big role in uh, the in this law. So um, what uh, what we did is that uh, there was this climate law um, and uh, we saw it uh, as an uh, opportunity to propose our amendments uh, to talk about uh, vegetarian meals in school canteens. And so for that, we had to build, uh, before that, some um, some uh, partnership with uh, key uh, politicians that were going to propose these amendments and then uh, defend them. So uh, we had to do, of course, uh, political outreach, uh, maintaining good relations uh, with, uh, with politicians. And um, what we did after that is that there was a clear lack of uh, theoretical and uh, practical expertise about uh, these, uh, these uh, vegetarian options. So the NGOs uh, produced by themselves some uh, expertise. We, we collected data um, in uh, contents that were already doing a lot of vegetarian meals. Um, again, I'm going to say uh, just after what, what kind of data uh, we, we provided. And the government also uh, made uh, such studies. So uh, then we had a lot more of, uh, of material to defend uh, our proposals. And also uh, strategically, um, uh, some organizations, some scientists and some politicians, just before this climate law, just before the vote, uh, they made petitions uh, to, uh, to make this uh, debate uh, arise in uh, the society. So uh, here at is here are what, in uh, our opinion, uh, are the best or the key arguments in France, and of course they may differ dep depending uh, on your country. Um, so first, uh, the inclusiveness of uh, vegetarian plant-based meals, because in France, uh, in school canteens, you have a lot of um, of children who have um, religious diets. And then vegetarians or even better uh, vegan meals uh, can be eat can be eaten by everyone. Then, of course, the environmental benefits. So we made some calculations about uh, how many uh, kilograms of CO2 uh, is spared for each vegetarian meal. Uh, same for the water for biodiversity. Uh, then there were the there were the health benefits. So. It, this is really, really a crucial point in France because there are a lot of resistance uh, um, on this particular aspect. I'm going to, to talk about it later. So we had to, to show that, um, uh, to, to give uh, some uh, health expertise to show that children that don't, don't need to eat uh, fish or meat every day in school. Uh, what is also a very good argument is that uh, vegetarian meals are cheaper. Uh, you can do a lot of uh, money saving with, with, then, with, with uh, these vegetarian meals, and then you can uh, put back the savings uh, in better products. And for example, it's really good um, for advocacy in France to say that we can then buy uh, better meat with this, uh, with this savings. So it may not be the case in every country, but in France, not opposing too strongly uh, the meat and the vegetarian dishes, it's very important. And finally, we provided a lot of examples of, of contents that were already doing uh, a daily vegetarian options, for example. So here are also some examples of uh, these, uh, these studies. So uh, a study about uh, the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, if you uh, put more vegetarian options in a school canteen. And also a studies about the uh, quantity of organic meat that are um, uh, that are uh, bought by a canteen, whether it uh, does a lot of vegetarian meals or not. And also, what 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 thing that uh, in France at least was very uh, good is that um, 
since the politicians were very reluctant to um, immediately impose uh, this uh, weekly vegetarian menu, we started with an experimentation of two years. And then uh, we said, then the government said, if the evaluation uh, of this uh, experimentation is good, then we are going to make it permanent. So if in your country, for example, you encounter a lot of resistance, maybe it's good to start with just uh, an experimentation. Uh, and if it, if it goes well, then it is going to, to be made permanent. And of course, uh, there was a lot of luck. Uh, the, the, the votes were very tight and uh, we, just before the vote, we were pretty sure that we were going to lose, and finally uh, we won. But yeah, luck, of course, it, it plays a big, a big factor. Uh, I'm going to go quick in this. So challenges and obstacles. So of course, France is not the, the best country <laughs> to make advances in uh, vegetarian diets or vegetarian meals. Uh, there is a strong um, culinary tradition. Uh, with a lot of meat in it. Uh, there are powerful uh, lobbies for, for meat uh, that uh, do not like this kind of proposals. And also there are these uh, health and uh, nutrition concerns. Uh, and for the moment in the law, it is written that uh, at least eight uh, for each uh, 20 meals, eight of them have to contain meat or, or fish. So of course it, it limits what, what you can do. And it led uh, recently, two years ago, uh, to a big backla backlash when the town of Lyon uh, suppressed meat meals in its canteens. It was just for uh, simplicity because uh, there was the the, uh, the pandemic and uh, they have to uh, made uh, to make some choices. So they uh, they ch choose just to uh, do the vegetarian menu for I think three months. But still, uh, then you. Here are some uh, farmers that are protesting against it. So you have to be very cautious not, not to go too quickly in France. And are the laws applied? Well, it's not very clear. Um, in school canteens, we think that it's the case uh, for the primary schools, uh, but there are, are really a lack of um, evaluation by the government. So here, uh, I think that the NGOs have a good um, impact by raising the issue. Uh, has asking the government to make to make evaluation, working with ministries uh, so that they inform contents under the, their jurisdiction that they have to respect the law. So th this is what uh, we we are doing with uh, with asset vegetal. But yes, you you have to continue pushing if you want these laws to to be applied. Um, and I don't know if I have uh, some uh, minutes left, or maybe we can so discuss it. In, uh... Yeah, I think probably for the Q and A, if that's yeah. okay. Okay. So uh, thank you for your attention, and uh, you can uh, write to us at this uh, mail address. Thank you very much. I think um, getting the legal aspects on, on your side is so important, and well done for what you, you have achieved. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, so we're now moving on to a speaker from my own country who's been involved in publishing a national food strategy. So from the UK government, specifically um, the Department for Environment, Food and Rural, Rural Affairs commissioned an independent review led by Henrald Dimbleby and a team of advisors. One of them, the chief analytical advisor for the national food strategy, Dustin Benton, is here with us today to talk about how this special process came about and how a plant-based diet is featured in their recommendation. So over to you, um, Dustin. Well, thank you very much. And I should say, I no longer work for the government. So I have the freedom to be slightly more, um, how should I put it, uh, honest than I, I perhaps might have done uh, if you'd had this presentation from me a year ago. Um, so thank you all very much. I'm gonna try to tell you three things about the uh, national food strategy. First, I will pull back the curtain a little on how we put it together. Um, second, I will talk a little bit about the causes that we thought of what was going wrong in the food system played out um, and how that um, sort of touches on the recommendations that we made. Uh, and then finally, I, I will highlight a few of those key recommendations. Uh, and I should say we didn't start from the idea that plant-based diets were necessarily the right thing. That was a conclusion we came to from the work that we did. Uh, I'm going to try to do this all in 10 minutes, so I can't be comprehensive. Uh, please do ask questions. There will definitely be holes in what I say. Uh, so I'll move straight on. Next slide, please. And apologies for um, not controlling my own slides. Uh, so what was the National Food Strategy? Uh, it was the first sort of root and branch review of the food system in the UK 
for nearly a century, uh, built on a whole series of partial reviews. We undertook an enormous program of engagement. We had 75 visits. We had public dialogues all across the, uh, the country, uh, talking to real, normal people. We had input from literally hundreds of world-class experts on nutrition, on the environment, on food uh, inequality, on poverty. Uh, it was an extraordinary opportunity, um, and we uh, made the most of it in terms of matching citizens with evidence. Uh, I will talk just a little bit about the conditions that went into it. The first was that the remit was agreed by ministers in advance, and it looked very explicitly at sustainability, which is what I will mostly talk about. Very happy to pick up on health things um, in the Q&A. The remit gave the team, the National Food Strategy team, of which I was a part, very broad discretion to determine our process and approach. We built advisory groups, which we used to test evidence and recommendations, which were very expansive across farming, food businesses, civil society and citizens. Uh, we engaged incredibly widely with citizens, as I said, uh, and we were basically given the remit to search out without sort of fear or favour. It was extremely powerful to have an independent review that was uh, inside government, as that gives you a huge amount of convening power. Uh, and I don't think the review would have been possible without uh, that sort of government power and, uh, and associated freedom. We also had a very strong sense of mission across the team. We were uh, full of experts um, within the team, and I think that made a very large difference. Next slide, please. I'm going to briefly run through our diagnosis. Next slide, please, uh, just to give you a sense of it. We had two main concepts that we came up with, uh, which uh, looked at the feedback loops that are responsible for the main ills in our food system, which are uh, essentially health and the natural environment. Uh, the, on the natural environment side of things, we saw that there wasn't a feedback loop. That is to say, their nature is invisible to the economic systems that drive our activity. Because nature is invisible, we try trash the planet without even thinking about it. Uh, we also came up with something we called the junk food cycle, and that is that junk food, food that is bad for us, is disproportionately profitable and also is very tasty. The fact that it's profitable and tasty causes companies to invest in marketing, which causes you to want it more. It's an incredibly powerful cycle, and the answer to both of these, but particularly the junk food cycle, is you need very clear government intervention. You can't allow the market to look after itself because the market cannot possibly work to deliver the outcomes we all want, healthy, sustainable food. Next slide, please. That brings us on to market power, um, which is incredibly important. If you are trying to change a system, you need to understand uh, who is, has a big stake in that system. So this is a diagram. It's a very complex. I won't talk through it in any detail, which just shows how the supply chain is split up uh, with uh, revenue, uh, across the bottom there, you can see the, the width of the revenue, particularly in the retail sector, and then market concentration. So you can kind of get a fairly obvious point of where you might want to intervene if you're seeking to make change in the food system. And I should say that plant-based foods are also su uh, subject to the junk food cycle that I mentioned before. Um, so they are also incredibly important to think about power in. Next slide, please. We got to plants because we looked at land area. So this map shows a schematic of the land area of the UK. We use 75% of it uh, to grow food. An equivalent area overseas, which are the hexagons that are in that box on the side. And next slide, please. Uh, all of that is basically down to uh, meat. So an area equivalent of Great Britain is used to produce beef, lamb, and dairy. Two thirds of our food calories and half of our protein come from the areas you now see, which are plants. Plants are incredibly important. And next slide, please. We showed that it would be very straightforward to feed Britain very well on half the land. This is a Senke diagram showing the steps, but the biggest step you can see there, which is most of the way off to the right, is eating less meat. Uh, this is difficult, but uh, we had to sort of confront it. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more. I've, I've realized I've cantered through a huge amount of evidence very, very rapidly. And I will come on to the crux of the challenge. We realized that um, meat consumption, excessive meat consumption is an incredible, incredibly difficult subject. Um, and we did a bunch of work. This is just one example of um, measures to reduce meat consumption. We had a speaker from the Netherlands talk before about the work that they've done. This is just a snapshot, but I want to show you, uh, I want to give you the idea that was the main issue for us. 
people don't understand that meat is the problem, but you can persuade them. That's what we found through our public dialogues. It wasn't too difficult to get people to understand that actually both health and environmental challenges come from excessive meat consumption. But when you start to get to pricing interventions, um, they're not particularly pro um, they're not particularly uh, popular, and that's especially the case uh, if you describe it as um, uh, hitting on fresh meat. Um, and the reason why we tested this frame, the idea of fresh meat, is because we were thinking about what the opposition would say to any sort of proposal that might cause meat consumption to fall. What we found, and you can see there in purple on this slide, that there is essentially a blocking minority, even on taxes on processed meat, which, as you can see, are, are the most popular of this set, ditto the um, target for, for supermarkets, and that that blocking minority would prevent politicians from making change, even if you could demonstrate that it was very, very popular. So we needed a different strategy. Um, and I will touch on four of the recommendations, next slide please, that we found to try to get around the fact that a pricing intervention, which is although the most obvious, wasn't likely in our view to work. The first was that government needed to lead. So we needed public sector leadership. Um, government couldn't expect individuals and organizations to make changes to the food that they eat if it didn't lead by example. Uh, so we were uh, we asked the government to actually enforce the rules and to improve the governance of the food system when it came to things that the state buys. So many more plants, much less high fat, sugar and salt foods, and that includes meat. Next slide, please. The second major intervention we thought about was we need to innovate. Uh, and the reason is that um, people like meat because it's tasty. There are some exciting alternatives to meat. Um, and uh, if you have ever traveled to India, you will know that there's an entire grand civilization uh, which has managed to make extraordinarily tasty food out of plants. But that wasn't particularly salient for the UK. And so we thought we would uh, take a, a, a big innovation push, probably the biggest bit of which is alternative proteins, which you can see at the top of that list. We quantified the greenhouse gas benefits and the land release benefits. Um, we think that there is an opportunity to make things that taste like meat, but probably are made out of plants or other sorts of alternatives. And that the UK ought to be very good at this. Um, that's set within a wider context of lots of options to improve innovation. Next slide, please. You can't just rely on techno fixes, though. Uh, techno fixes are incredibly important. Uh, my background is in the climate space, and my goodness, we have used technology, renewables, for example, to uh, to improve the carbon emissions um, that are coming out of our society. But you also need social pressure, and we thought it was incredibly important to require retailers, restaurants fast food outlets, contract caterers, wholesalers, the whole food system to report on what they were selling. Um, these, they needed to report um, volume and value. They needed to report the different sorts of foods, including meat, protein by type and origin. And that would create the basis for social pressure to support companies to move faster, particularly on more plant-based foods. Next slide, please. We also thought about the people who produce the meat. So the farmers. Now, uh, farmers in, in the UK, like most of Europe, uh, mostly don't make money out of meat. Uh, so we thought we needed to guarantee the budget for agricultural payments, but we needed to change its purpose. And the analysis that we did showed that um, the least productive 20% of farmland in England produces only 3% of the food that we grow, and that it would be much more valuable for society to pay the farmers who farm this land to restore nature and uh, restore uh, and sequester carbon carbon rather than trying hard to produce food and not being enabled to do so. Now, I realize I'm out of my 10 minutes, so I will go to my final slide, please. Um, and that is that we intervened uh, through the national food strategy and candidly, we thought that the changes that we might make might last for in policy, perhaps five years. Um, government strategies have a way of not ending up implemented. So we thought we needed a mechanism to uh, legislate for long-term change. And there were two components of that. Uh, the first was a good food bill. And the second was to task the uh, Food Standards Agency to report regularly to Parliament against the goals that we um, suggested, one of which was a reduction in meat consumption by about a third by 2030. Uh, as part of that, we suggested a reference diet, um, as, which I think previous speakers have spoken on, and those um, would have created the opportunity for change to be longer term than simply the time that we had available. Anyway, my apologies for overrunning. Uh, thank you all very much. That's it for me, and I look forward to your questions.
Great, thank you very much, uh, Dustin. I mean, so much common sense from you. I wish you were still working for the um, government. It would give us a bit more hope here in the UK. Anyway, never mind. Um, so the last speaker today is, so is Sophie Benhoven. Sophie is project officer for Ghent on Guard, the Ghent food strategy. Within it, she developed the Ghent Green Bowl, the first local protein strategy. She follows up on everything related to schools and school meals, including the European School Food for Change project. And she provides support and advice on tenders for catering and events. So over to you, Sophie. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Sophie from the city of Ghent. We're going to the local level now. Um, Ghent is a city in Belgium. We have like uh, 270,000 inhabitants, so it's big, but not, not that big. Um, it's especially a student and harbor city uh, with a high degree of diversity. We launched, launched our food strategy in 2013. Um, the name of the food strategy is uh, Gent on Garde. We have three goals. Um, the first one is we want a short sustainable food uh, chain. Second one is no food waste. And a third one is sustainable food for everyone. But that third one, that's uh, quite a broad, um, yeah, broad formulated. So it, in, in concrete, it focuses on three concrete acts aspects, access to food, a whole school food approach and protein transition. And it's the third one I'm talking, I want to talk to you about. In 2009, um, we launched the campaign Thursday Veggie Day together with uh, Eva Vizetui. Um, now, Eva Vizetui, now they are called Proveg. It's a nonprofit organization that stimulates and helps people to eat more plant-based. During uh, years, we had a partnership with them. We had a partnership agreement uh, to help us fulfilling our goal of uh, reducing meat consumption. We have uh, uh, several actions uh, we did in the campaign, we concretized in the campaign. Um, first one was uh, directed to restaurants and chefs. Uh, we organized cooking workshops, lectures for uh, large large scale kitchens coaching of large scale kitchens workshops for hotels we developed a map the veggie plan for the city of ghent with all the vegetarian restaurants on it um, we did we sensitized our uh, citizens and uh, very important we tried to set up the good example uh, with our internal city catering and with our procurement um, Thursday Veggie Day became a success, and why is that? The power of this campaign is that the message is in the name, Thursday Veggie Day, and it's also easy to implement. Because, and because of this low threshold, uh, the idea was copied uh, all over the world. So that's why the outside world started to call us uh, Ghent as a veggie capital. Um, now, if we take a look um, at the city and uh, its citizens, we see that um, Ghent as veggie capital, we have a high amount of uh, veggie friendly restaurants, but we also have like 40% of the Ghent citizens that eat uh, vegetarian min minimum once a week. That's the double of the average in, in Flanders. Um, we can't say this is a direct result of the campaign, but the, the identity we got uh, as a city will definitely have played a role in it. And the Thursday Veggie Day campaign, because of the low threshold, was copied all over the world uh, in big cities and small cities and regions uh, and so on. And now after a successful 10 years of campaigning, the question came, what is your next step uh, what is, what are you doing what is the next thing you will do first we were thinking in terms of campaigns what do we have to do more days in a week or uh, do we go from veggie to plant based um, but in the meanwhile also all sorts of campaigns popped up uh, from different organizations different levels and we thought no the it, it, 
we don't need to develop a, a new campaign. It's something else we have to do. Um, and the campaign only focuses on, on consumption. Uh, and it's very important to also focus on the production side. And also, there are lots of stakeholders. There are lots of aspects that are uh, in this topic playing uh, a, a part of the, are part of the game. So that's why we said we need a separate strategy in our uh, overall food policy. Um, and that's why, why the Gans Green Bowl, the Gant Green Bowl, uh, came in. So that's the name of our uh, protein strategy. In our strategy, we brought together all kinds of uh, actors and stakeholders, universities, civil society, companies, and so on. So uh, we went in little discussion groups um, to talk about uh, our strategy and what needs to be uh, in it. Um, so I already mentioned, besides the consumption side, we also need to integrate the production side. We wanted one story with no opposing camps, but uh, we wanted to search for the collective, uh, for a collective uh, common story. We launched our uh, strategy in November 2021, and uh, we have like a participant, be participative uh, B2B platform also launched on that a day of November 21, uh, in which the Ghent actors can make their actions visible. Um, but I will send, I will put the link in the chat uh, afterwards so you can have a look at it. Um, if we go to the consumption side, our first goal is that by 2030, we want to change the rates, ratio of consumption of animal proteins versus plant proteins. Uh, and alternative proteins, we want to make it 40% to 60%, while at this moment it's still the opposite. This goal is the same goal as the Flemish government launched in 2022 uh, in the Green Deal protein shift. Um, three parts are in our strategy. Uh, we want to increase access to sustainable uh, proteins. That's about availability, price, uh, food environment. The second one is we want to increase competences, the knowledge, the skills, the attitudes of people, and uh, we want an increased support for sustainable proteins. We want more people to be convinced of uh, the importance um, of it. And then uh, the second goal, by 2030, Ghent will be a good example of sustainable protein production. We want more uh, sustainable production of animal proteins. We want an increased production of plant proteins for human consumption. And we also want development and implementation of new alternative qualitative high protein uh, sources. Um, an example of that are the microbial proteins. Um, all parties we need uh, to make and consume these proteins, uh, they are present in hand. We have the resources, we have research centers who are uh, researching on processing techniques and so on. Um, until large scale production, everything you need uh, that uh, for that. So that's why this is also a specific. Uh, Ali, this is also specifically mentioned in our uh, strategy. And then a third goal: uh, by 2025, we will have enough data from our monitoring system to refine our protege. Uh, strategy and make uh, choices. At this moment, we really have a lack of data that can strengthen our prote protein strategy. So that's why we made it an explicit uh, goal. Um, I will go quickly over this because I have only one minute and a half left. Um, we have lots of collaborations with our food council, with our culinary council, with culinary festival, with our tourism department, but also with higher government, with the Flemish government, uh, with Europe, we're in several projects, with universities and research institutes. Um, we take up actions uh, together and to, towards the private sector. We try to map practices and try to detect gaps uh, in practices. We try to link organizations. We try to stimulate new projects and we try to uh, communicate uh, 
we do not try to, we do it. <laughs> we communicate about good uh, projects. Specifically for agriculture, uh, we also have uh, city objectives on agriculture. We have an action plan. Uh, we have subsidy for farmers who want to converse to organic and short chain uh, and so on. And uh, I already mentioned we want to uh, set up the good example as a city. Um, so we, uh, in our, from, I'm from the Department of Climate and Environment. We adv give advice on pl public procurement uh, for food and events. Uh, we also signed up the good cool food pledge where we monitor our CO2 emissions uh, that's uh, that's come from the purchases of the food and uh, we help our city caterer in changing their menu and communicating about it. We're also in a school food for change project. I saw someone else from the school food uh, for change project is also here in the public um, in which we try to change the, uh, we want to realize the protein shift um, and not only in the school meals, but also the way uh, we want we want to use a whole school food approach in which uh, the schools also think about how to deal with food, not only uh, in the canteen, but also in the classroom and so on. And then we have actions towards citizens, all kind of campaigns uh, and things that try to stimulate them to eat more plant-based. Um, and then we have future actions towards uh, more vulnerable groups. We want to coach large scale kitchens, uh, social restaurants, um, further take further actions and research. And yeah, that was it in a nutshell. If anyone has questions, I will also put the link of our food strategy uh, into the chat so you can uh, read that also. Um, afterwards. Thank you very much, Sophie. That You're was huge, hugely inspiring. And, uh, you know, what great achievements there, really shifting the community to eating more plant based and making it fun and enjoyable and delicious as we know that it can be. So, thank you. Um, so, we're going to move on to um, questions now. Um, I did misspeak earlier. There won't be any um, putting on cameras or, or anything. So, all your questions do need to be. Um, in the Q&A function, which I'll keep an eye on. Um, so um, we haven't got any open questions yet. So please do pop your questions in, tell us who it's directed to, and I'll be sure to um, ask them to our panel. But I will kick off. Um, I'll start with Dustin, if that's OK. Um, you know, we have clear evidence um, from your report and from many others that we need to reduce meat consumption to improve our health and the health of the planet and, of course, the welfare of all the animals we share this planet with. Yet there is so much false information and lobbying to prevent this change. Um, how did you deal with this, um, with, with, with the food, um, with the national food strategy? And how, how did you try and get that scientific evidence across? And then we'll put it out to the other panel members. I guess two ways in, in principle. Uh, the first is that we spoke to loads of scientists from lots of different um, uh, academic institutions uh, and uh, organizations that, that work in this area. And we did so in a way that tried to get experts to disagree with each other. So we had the best version of the arguments. Um, and that meant that uh, we also had uh, a whole bunch of uh, scientific bodies, including DEFRA's own internal scientific advisory uh, service crawl over our analysis so that we were pretty confident that we hadn't got anything wrong. And that's obviously essential, uh, but being right doesn't win an argument. So the second thing that we did was uh, rather than taking the issue straight on with a pricing based approach, because we looked at the evidence and, and thought that this blocking minority of people who would be very exercised by the idea that anyone might do anything to raise the price of meat, which is unsustainably cheap um, because we externalize the environmental and health costs of overconsumption, uh, we thought we would try to come at it sideways um, and hence the recommendations that we made. Uh, and that indirect approach was our way of attempting to create change without provoking an allergic reaction. Yeah, no, that, that's really interesting to hear. And I guess, Anne, you've sort of moved that few steps forward where we hope to see the, the, the UK with sort of implementing 
um, all of this evidence into a, you know, a proper food based dietary guideline for all citizens, um, <laughs> getting people to adhere to them is like the, a different issue. Um, but so how, how, how were you able to overcome those sort of negative forces that, that really will try and keep the status quo? Well, I'm not sure that we've overcome those negative uh, voices, but um, we sort of work as um, evidence-based administration. And as I also talked about in my presentation, we put a lot of effort in when talking with our stakeholders, we do not discuss the evidence. We discuss how we word the evidence afterwards. Um, one, some of the discussions we had when we worked out the new guidelines was whether we should have like an, a certain amount for, for pork, for chicken, uh, et cetera, or whether we should talk about meat in general. And we decided that we would put it all together in one because um, we have to learn ourselves and the public and consumers and the whole fit food system then when you prepare a meal uh, it's not always necessary that the meat is the center of the meal so if that's why we decided to put all sort of meats together in our advice i know that i'm not exactly answering your question serene but really we we sort of went the other way around that you did, Dustin, because we didn't have these discussions. Well, we knew who would think that it would not be advisable. And we also knew who would think it would be a, a good idea. And we sort of uh, we put those people together and let them talk and disagree. Well, sort of the way, same way that, that you said, but, but we refused sort of to discuss the evidence since we are basing all our work on the guidance from the Danish uh, National Food Institute. So we can't just, in some concerns, shift away from their advice. And we had given them a task and telling them to say, if we want to develop a, a diet that is not only healthy for people, but also uh, healthier for, for climate, how would you uh, set together uh, those guidelines? And, and then they gave us uh, this report that I also talked about earlier. And that was sort of the base. And I know that I make it sound rather easy. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I can appreciate that. And and, and I guess um, the first question from the audience from Jenna Lee that actually I might put to Sophie, um, just um, really sort of relates to what we've been discussing. So Jenna is from Ireland and she wants advice on how to effectively communicate advocating towards a plant based food system, really, because it seems that the Irish culture really has meat and dairy production and consumption sort of embedded. And it's very difficult to move away from that narrative. Yet in Ghent, you've managed to sort of culturally shift um, what is acceptable and embed this sort of into a community and, and, and sort of a public way of, um, of eating, really. So I wonder whether you've got some insights and in, in how to effectively communicate. Yeah. Um... We're also struggling with that because, um, okay, we already achieved some things, but we still have lots of difficulties and lots of people who say, no, don't touch my plate, please. Um, but one thing, one rule we use uh, in our department is to never use the word less, because if you say less, then people already will be offensive, like uh, you're taking something away from me. So what we're doing is we try to promote um, more the, the variety, the diversity, the new tastes that, that people don't know. Um, we try to focus on that. And that is, for example, why we uh, organized um, a vegetarian barbecue uh, contest. Um, because we wanted to show people what they can do uh, on their barbecue without, I, because lots of people don't know what they can make on the barbecue that is not meat. Um, so we want to, um, we don't want to convince them, we want to uh, uh, attract them, or how do you say it? Um, 
that they that they get attracted to to do it more mm -hmm. than than we want to yeah yeah, so it's about the positive them. messaging, what's there to gain the yep. sort of variety, as you say, rather than thinking about removing removing things. Um, and it's sort of the same thing that I do in clinical practice. You don't talk about people can't eat this, can't eat that. You 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 talk about sort of crowding out um, the less good with the abundance of um, healthy plant foods. Um, yes. And sort of on a related um, topic um, then, um, uh, uh, Sophie, what, I mean, did you do you particularly speak to individual or personal health or to climate, or it doesn't really feature in your messaging? Um, um, we use the same, the both at the same time, um, but we know there has been already several uh, researchers um, that also research wh why uh, people are uh, eating more plant based. What can, wh why would they get convinced? And health is more is is on the first place. Um, climate is more far away, but health is more on the first place. But um, I think it was Anna who mentioned it in the beginning. Uh, if you say health uh, and uh, sustainable, that we use it in in, in the same sentence, um, because mostly it goes hand in hand. Not always, but uh, yeah, that's why we use it together. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, Jerry, I'm just coming around to you. I mean, what what are your recommendations for um, cooperation with the authorities and for communication with politicians? What, how do you you feel the best way to reach them would be? Mm -hmm. Well, in the in the first years, uh, we, we had a lot of contact with the Ministry of Agriculture and, and uh, the policy officers who supported our proposal and did their best and, and even the, the minister was also um, uh, positive about it and they, uh, the, she, she was from a Christian Democratic Party who also had a, a Mitex proposal in the election uh, uh, program so she was on our hand um, but uh, she, yeah, but and but the, the other political parties in the in 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 the, the government were were against. So she had a problem to to really implement it. Uh, so um, yeah, the solution was finding uh, new ways to to do more studies on it. So keep it on the political agenda, and it's it's still there. So we are having many, many discussions with politicians and we have, uh, I think, 15 political parties in the Netherlands, so it's a lot of work. Uh, uh, but um, yeah, and we, yeah, we, we, we talk uh, about uh, the, 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 the benefits of it uh, for both public health, reducing healthcare costs, which are increasing everywhere, also in the Netherlands, and people don't like this, uh, but we show and this was research done by the government themselves that healthcare costs will go down and 8,000 uh, people will not become sick because of overconsumption of red meat and processed meat. So uh, I think health um, uh, yeah, will do the work and also of course climate is important. Uh, uh, so yes, we, we keep continuing and, and uh, try to have much media attention as possible by writing opinion articles, etc. And uh, yeah. yeah, thank you. It needs a constant, uh, constant attention, really, doesn't it, to keep it in the forefront of people's agenda. Um, D Dustin, I, I mean, you, you possibly in part um, answered this question, but from, um, Fran Francisco asks, do you think that it will be possible to completely do away with agriculture, given how unsustainable it is? And of course, um, uh, you know, considering the ethical aspects um, to the animals that we raise for food. I, I think that is more of a cultural question than a scientific one. Um, uh, what, what I observe about most European farming is that it sees animals as an important part of a farm system, even if in practice um, a lot of arable now is, is principally supported by um, uh, synthetic chemical, chemicals and therefore an animal never goes anywhere near that. Um, whether it would be possible from a health perspective and an environmental perspective, yes, uh, there are perfectly healthy vegan diets um, and you could in principle design a perfectly healthy vegan um, land use system. So there's no technical barrier there and that's without any new technologies to be clear. The new technologies really provide additional flavor um, and uh, 
monthly opportunities for companies to, to sell different sorts of products. Um, where we went quite heavily on the alternative proteins uh, end of the spectrum in the food strategy. And quite a question which I'm often asked is, um, do you really need alternative proteins? Because uh, certainly one of our scientific advisors uh, started by saying, you know, most people get most of their protein from plants. And if you if you want protein, you know, a, a loaf of bread will give you all the protein you need for, for a day. So kind of don't worry about this. It's a bit of a food industry myth. Uh, and she is a very eminent uh, nutritional scientist uh, who said this. Uh, but I strongly suspect that there will probably be a role for some animals um, in uh, agriculture, just nothing like the numbers who we have today. It's, it's flatly unsustainable, and clearly our consumption uh, at the levels that we have is, is unsustainable for our own health. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. And I think, you know, I also endorse your nutritionist's um, uh, uh, advice in that, you know, we just need to eat more variety of the plant foods we're already producing. But as you say, to um, to keep the food industry um, actors in play, you know, these alternate sources will always have a role. And culturally, we're so used to having sort of ready prepared meals that that's going to take a shift in itself, really, isn't it? So um, uh, I would just add, and uh, look, customers have a very strong preference yeah. for, for meaty flavors. I mean, people yeah. like bacon. And who am I to say that you shouldn't like bacon? It's a yeah. processed meat. It's not very healthy, but, um, you know. Yes. We were very liberal in our approach uh, in the food strategy. Yeah, but I mean, I think that's also quite a, a recent shift, you know, from Second World War. You know, we weren't we didn't have that sort of level of a desire um, in, in the recent past. But um, that's a that's a different uh, argument, potentially. Here, then I'll bring you in here. Um, a question for, for, for you about how you're sharing um, this information and your projects with other cities and countries. Are you in contact with other similar um, projects? So have you been working slowly, solely sort of in your in 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 France? Yeah, so we are in contact with uh, Menu Per Pew in uh, Italy, uh, which is an initiative uh, from um, SRE Animali. So they, they also work with uh, with school canteens. And uh, I think that we talked together maybe one and, or two years ago. And uh, we talked um, to them about our our green uh, food week uh, which is uh, a week during uh, um, which each uh, each day the the canteen propose a vegetarian option and um, then they have done that with a uh, huge success in the in Italy uh, making a town such as I think Rome and Milan to to commit uh, to do uh, one week uh, I don't want to to uh, to give false information, but I think that it was vegan, uh, vegan option or maybe vegan meal for every children during this week, uh, for uh, so the schools contains in uh, Milan and Rome. Uh, so yeah, uh, we are definitely talking uh, with them, and we also uh, consider to do the same in France. That uh, during uh, maybe maybe in October, for example, uh, doing one week. Uh, in which every city or uh, uh, high school contents that wants to participate propose these kinds of um, of, uh, of a vegetarian alternative. So yes, we are trying to to get the best of the the best of of each other. Uh, I guess also that there is a Proveg in the UK uh, which is doing the same. We had some exchange with, with them, but uh, not that much. Uh, but yeah, I, I guess it would be good if there was some kind of, of network of uh, organization doing it. Uh, I think that Proveg is uh, starting to to do that, so uh, we are looking forward uh, to to it. Yeah, no, I agree. We the, at the last um, panel discussion that we had um, uh, in November, we had um, representative from the school plates program at Proveg who are really have had great success um, converting sort of school meals into more plant-based, you know, putting them at the forefront of, of menus while still sort of keeping within our regulations that still require schools to serve um, uh, meat and, and dairy. Um, so, so they've done done a great job for sure. I'd love to see these changes in the hospital space, um, yeah. regardless of what we think about processed red meat. I don't think it has a place in a, in a hospital, but um, that's my uphill challenge currently. Um, and if I just can add uh, one thing, is that uh, I think that, uh, for example, an uh, an NGO has to be very uh, careful about uh, um, their own um, school canteen system in their own country because it can be so different 
in uh, different countries. For example, I guess that in some countries, the most effective thing would be just to go directly to Sodexo or Ilya or, or these catering companies and work only with them because they are providing 99% uh, of the meals in one country. So really, I think that the, the, the approaches should differ from one country to another. <laughs> Yeah, and interestingly, it is Sodexo in New York City um, that have helped transition the hospitals over to plant-based meals by default. So in 11 New York City hospitals um, where patients receive plant-based meals as the default and you have to request animals if you want them as part of your meal, and that's been hugely successful. So as you say, you need to bring in all the players that are providing the, the food in these institutions and in the public sector um, thank you. I, there's a question about um, Germany, but I think Frederic has left, so I'm not sure we're going to be able to answer that. And then, unless anyone else has any, anyone from the panel has any views about the uptake of plant-based diets across Germany, um, we might have to leave that one. Um, so uh, another question um, around um, health risks potentially. I'm not sure who the right person to speak to this is. I'm certainly happy to answer this question if no one else wants to about the health risks of switching children to vegetarian um, diets um, early in life and what age would this be risk free? Does, does anyone on the panel want to comment? on this at all? I mean, was that something that was discussed amongst your projects in terms of more plant-based diets for, for schools? And we have, we have had some discussions uh, regarding uh, especially the vegan diet. In Denmark, we share guidelines for uh, small children from zero to, to two years old. We share them with the health authorities on the, um, from the food authorities. And we actually advise uh, small children not to eat vegan totally. It's not that you can't eat vegan meals or something like that, but I have like have eating vegan uh, diet only when you're from zero to two, we, it's not advisable in Denmark. And the, the reason why we do that is that in Denmark, we are rather skeptical towards uh, fortified foods. So we do not have a lot of fortified foods. And we also tend to see that um, it's, not, it's not impossible to serve a, a well-prepared vegan meal or well-prepared vegan diet, but it uh, demands that you have uh, some sort of knowledge regarding how to put together your meal. And we're not sure that most of the parents are available or that of that knowledge so so to be absolutely sure we do not recommend a vegan diet but of course you can eat vegan if that's what you do but we have developed uh, guidelines for vegetarian meals for kindergarten school and canteen so that is very advisable uh, in Denmark but the vegan part for the small kids we uh, so far we do not advise that yeah, I mean, it's interesting because here in the UK, the British Dietetic Association have clearly stated that, you know, a fully plant based or vegan meals are appropriate for all ages and stages of um, life. I, I do agree that we do need to have them appropriately planned, but I might counter that argument for the UK in that currently the U, the typical um, UK diet for children uh, is far from optimal. So, <laughs> yes. um, yeah, but maybe doing... you also have uh... Uh, a lot more of fortified foods we, than we, have, in we, we have very very few because yeah. Danes don't buy fortified foods yeah that's interesting so that's yeah. the problem yeah very much in the plant-based sort of education and, and food movement it is about supporting people to choose those fortified yes um, you know um, non-dairy milks even though we're probably not allowed to call them milks anymore no. but um and yogurts and, and beverages and so forth. So, so yes, that, that is part of it, only just because we're so reliant on, on getting calcium from um, cow's dairy currently. Um, but, and, and certainly my, my organization have a number of families who have successfully raised um, vegan children. So, but I agree, I think we need to be having appropriate education and um, you know, uh, community support if, if that's the route that families want to um, take for the various reasons. Um, coming back to um, Kevan, um, how did you gain a critical mass of politicians to openly support the movement um, with work and, and proposals? 
Well, I guess that's uh, that's why I, I said that there were so, so, some luck involved. Uh, I think that we, the best impact that we had, the the, organiz the NGOs, uh, was not so much to convince a critical mass than to have some key allies that uh, proposed our amendments uh, to be implemented in the law. Um, so then, of course, we, we made a lot of political outreach, uh, trying to talk to uh, um, each uh, political parties. But, uh, well, I think first we had some uh, lobbying experts from uh, the, the NGOs, that, so people that were um, working with the politician from a long time we just we didn't just arrive for for this law uh, uh three months ago so that's one very important thing uh then the the, the arguments i think that you all know them it's uh, basically uh, health environment uh costs I, I talked about it a little bit maybe animal welfare depending uh, on the country but yeah i, I don't know if you can really uh like uh make some make the politicians change uh their, their mind you have to maybe bring uh the the proposals to make some politicians uh, propose them in the law uh but i think that's uh, maybe 90 percent of the good impact that you can have I, at least for us in france it was mainly bringing this topic um uh, bringing the the arguments the data uh to the politicians that, that were already aligned with our proposal and then um uh, the, the, the they were the ones that uh, were doing the job but we didn't convince someone that was uh, uh very opposed to to this uh, at the beginning yeah thank you that that's really useful to hear i think um Jerome, you are just sort of typing the answer to the um next question but i might get you to speak to it or have you got rid of it i i don't know i think somebody was asking oh maybe you did um uh, uh somebody was asking what you're expecting um in the new eu sort of laws and proposals and what will be the negative and positive uh, aspects of that yes i was answering um uh, that i um, and positive about uh, that the, the, the polluter pays principle will be one of the guiding principles uh, and it has to be implemented in national food strategy so in some way it has to be yeah, reflected there. Um, I, I don't know exactly how it, this will be formulated and how obligatory it will be but it's positive. Uh, and but I fear that most of the things uh, will not really be obligatory, uh, except of public procurement, where where maybe I expect some stronger proposals. But the rest is more, yeah. There, there's a lot of resistance also from member states against it. Uh, so we have to see what will uh, be left uh, of it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, and and Sophie, br bringing you um, back in, I mean, what have you seen to be the biggest hurdles when trying to sort of implement um, your projects and how perhaps have you overcome them? Um, yeah, I think the first lack of communicative guidelines, um, clear guidelines, simple guidelines. Um, at this moment, the Flemish government is in uh, working on this. Uh, in the Green Deal um, protein shift uh, they developed. So we are really waiting uh, waiting for that because it can help us to tell the people it's not just it's not just uh, the city of Ghent who is uh, doing this or who is thinking about this, but this is something bigger um, and the higher the level from which the guidelines come the more people will accept it, I think. Um, and then also you need people who believe in the importance of the protein shift. Everything depends on which people are on which position um, in the different levels, in the different spaces. Um, for example, in the city, we, we need people uh, in our facility management um, who are believing in, in this story. Uh, we need people in our own uh, catering restaurant. Uh, we need uh, the politicians. So in every step, you need other people who are also believing that this protein shift needs to be made. And this is really cu crucial because you notice when people change job, for example, and someone else comes in, sometimes you have to put a step back uh, 
but this is normal and you have to, this is just the reality and and you have to deal with it that sometimes you you go steps further but sometimes you have to take a step back um yeah this is normal in a process like this i think yeah no absolutely thank you um dustin i'll come back to to you francisco asks um you know shouldn't we be concentrating on supporting um, farmers who currently farm animals to transition away towards producing plants and I think you you answered um, a little bit of this because um, and at the moment we're certainly in the UK we're propping up uh, farmers with huge subsidies I mean how, how do you think we we change this and the farming system in general uh, it's a good question and the short answer is yes we absolutely must support farmers um, but the the long answer is a little bit more complicated and I, I think challenging uh, the first thing to say is if if we ate mostly plant-based diets we would need fewer farmers um, and that's for the simple reason that animals are trophic trophically inefficient uh, it's a very geeky way of putting it so let me unpack it uh, if I feed 100 calories of grain to a cow and I eat the beef that comes out of the cow, I get three calories of beef. That's the most extreme example, but all animal-based proteins are, are lossy. So um, I believe that we harvest on the order of 10,000 calories per person per day at the point of production uh, across, the, across the globe. Um, we don't have a scarcity problem. Uh, we, we turn that scarcity in, into lots of animals, and uh, that's why um, I think farm animals are now over 40 times the weight of all wild animals on the planet. So it, it, uh, the reality is that if we move to a more plant-based diet, we will need fewer farmers. The opportunity, I think, is that we have moved to farming lots of land that is really not very good for farming. Speak to any farmer who farms difficult to farm land, and they work amongst the hardest. So I can give you figures from the UK just to give it to bring it to life. Um, farmers in less favoured areas, which is an EU category the UK has retained after leaving, typically make around 15,000 15, to 20,000 pounds per year and receive on the order of 20 to 30,000 pounds in subsidy. So that is to say they lose between 10, roughly 10,000 pounds per year on producing the food on their land. That's not because they're bad farmers or that they haven't worked hard. These are amongst the hardest working farmers in, in the country. Their land isn't very good at producing it, but their land is really good at storing carbon, if they manage it correctly, and restoring nature. These are public goods. We ought to pay for them. If we pay for them, certainly our analysis at Green Alliance, so this is no longer national food strategy, shows that you can increase farm incomes by at least 20% and often double them by paying farmers to uh, produce nature and sequester carbon rather than trying to use land that's bad for food uh, to try to produce it. So that, I think, is the strategy for, for quite a lot of farmers, particularly in the, most, um, the, the least affluent farmers. Yeah, no, no, that makes a lot of sense. You know, we need to use our farmers to provide all sorts of ecosystem services for us to, to flourish. And as you say, carbon capture and restoring nature are high up on the agenda there. And um, this is a very brief question from Olivia. Do, do any of you have any idea of percentages of pulses used and quinoa used for plant based meals in European countries? Anyone got any stats to hand for their countries? <laughs> we are quick fire. No, I think we probably don't know the exact figures. The UK eats very little, don't they, in terms of pulses and queen oil, that's for sure. But the percentage, I'm not sure. One, one thing I would say is that one of the recommendations for our billion pounds of innovation funding was, support for, was to support farmers to plant more pulses. Um, we have done an extraordinary amount of agronomic research into grains, um, you know, fantastic amounts. We have done nothing like that for pulses, whether it's for yield or for quality or, or ease of growing, etc. And plowing some public money into supporting better varieties of, of pulses is a, is a total no brainer. Yeah, agreed. And you were going to say something. I would just say that uh, the last survey we, we did of, about uh, Danish eating, ha eating habits, uh, Danes ate approximately two grams of pulses per day, and our recommendation says 100 grams. Mm -hmm. So there is uh, really room for improvement. But the government has set a, a so-called plant foundation with uh, 675 billion Danish crowns to fund out to farmers, food producers, et cetera, in order to 
high uh, to put more focus on the plant-based um, foods. So I find that very positive, but let's see uh, if it finds the way to our plates. No yeah. one knows, but we, we hope. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Um, so we're, we're coming up to the top of the hour soon. So I'm going to um, come towards our closing, but probably the last question is a sort of lightning round to all our panellists. I hope you've had a chance to think about this in advance. But what will your next step be in pushing a plant-based diet forward and who will help you achieve this? So in sort of one sentence, I'll start with you, Sophie, if that's okay. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, for us, it's like uh, bringing stakeholders together, mapping what they're doing, detecting gaps and putting an effort in, in where the gaps are. But it's just, an, a, a, yeah, something very general and you have to put everything together. So I just can't say this is what needs to happen now. It needs to happen all together. Mm -hmm. And not only in our level, but also on the Flemish, on the European level. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you. Kevin, what's next for you and who will be, you be drawing in to help you achieve this? Uh, so it will still be uh, in uh, collective catering. Uh, so making sure that the existing laws are applied and then uh, trying to make the, the next uh, ambitious law voted. We, we failed uh, some months ago. Uh, we proposed a law that wasn't voted, so we are going to try again. Great, thank you. Wishing you success with, with that. Jérôme, what about yourself? Yes, uh, so we our, our next steps will be continuing to uh, do the policy advocacy work and also uh, on the uh, field of catering, we, we try to, to uh, uh, have more more locations where, where the higher price of meat is paid and, and the lower price for vegan uh, meals is paid as well as a combination. Um, and so who will help? Yes, uh, our, our 60 partners, of course, and uh, I hope youth organizations will be and environmental groups. Uh, yes, uh, that's, that's my hope for the future. Yeah. Thank you. And Anne, what about you? Where next for the Danish guidelines? I think uh, the next two steps will be to work in pulses as part of the requirements in public procurement and also to establish a partnership around pulses. We have had very good um, experiences with partnerships around whole grains. So we hope to set up a partnership around pulses with stakeholders from all over, uh, from, from the whole food system. That's essential. You need both retailers, food producers, farmers, and also consumer uh, organizations to work with this. Yeah, fantastic. Look forward to hearing your updates. Thank you. And finally, Dustin, um, what is the Green Alliance up to? <laughs> Uh, well, first thing I want to say is we were very inspired by Denmark's uh, whole grains partnership. I think the, for, for me, one of the lessons, we all need to be a bit more Danish, uh, at least when it comes to fiber. Um, but it, as to what uh, we would like to see, um, I think the realistic fastest route for an uptake of more plants and diets is to focus on ready meals and pre-prepared foods. Uh, the UK eats half of the meat that it consumes in either processed or pre-prepared things. These are not where individual consumers are choosing the amount of meat they eat. That is determined by a food manufacturer or a, or a supermarket. Now, the UK is ahead of the pack, uh, but probably in a direction that uh, I would not advise that anyone heads. We are halfway between most of the, uh, most of the EU and the United States. So I would say we are the canary in the coal mine. Don't go the way that the UK is going from a health or a, or a planetary health perspective. Uh, and the way to do this is to intervene, to require food companies to make their ready meals, their pre-processed, all their prepared foods have more veg and less meat in it. Not necessarily none, but that is an incredibly effective route. And the EU has an option to do this through the forthcoming food sustainability law. So I would encourage you all to get out there and uh, lobby straight away. Yeah, no, that's a very interesting proposal and uh, on a similar vein to, to get our public sector catering to also commit to doing more, more of that, which has already started. Um, thank you very much. Um, so this just really leaves me to um, close our meeting with some um, key messages and really what I'm taking away from today's fantastic present presentations. Um, so really, there is no doubt that we have to shift the food system away from animal source foods to more plant-based um, diets and meals. 
if we don't, we're not going to be able to collectively meet our nature or climate commitments. And in order to do this, we've seen that we need to work in an, in an inclusive way, work together with civil society organizations and policymakers, yet have a fair and independent process whilst addressing cultural sensitivities. Um, there are also many levers through which these changes can um, be achieved. So we've talked about taxation, legislative change, subsidizing farmers appropriately to deliver ecosystem services, um, but also individ um, influencing individual consumption through um, public campaigns and public sector catering initiatives. And really any change away from consuming meat needs to be accompanied by appropriate education and messaging, including upskilling of chefs and um, communities in general. Um, and we've seen that there are enormous challenges to overcome, yet if this transition is successful, we have the opportunity to positively impact our own health, reduce food costs, and positively impact the, the planet. And of course, we mustn't forget the animals we share this planet um, with. Um, so this just leaves me to thank our panelists um, and of course the German Federal Ministry of Food and Agriculture for supporting this panel. Um, and just to remind you about what's coming next from Plant Europe, we will be sharing the recording that will be loaded to um, the Plant Europe website and the YouTube channel, so do look out for that and share it with your friends, uh, family and colleagues. Um, just to be aware that the, pro uh, the project team is currently working on a paper on best practices in Europe to include a plant-based diet in public policy. And so I'm sure many of these examples today will be included. Um, we'll, we'll be making you aware of this um, through our newsletter and through the membership network. So be sure to sign up as a member and subscribe to the newsletter. You can join the network and benefit from numerous small networking events and all of this for free. There's a small member event coming up focusing on the planetary health diet. So you can um, sign up, as I say, for free on the website um, as a member and join in. Um, you can also join the Plant Europe online community to network with each other um, and register for the newsletter to stay in touch. Um, the next panel discussion is due to be held in November and we'll be forthcoming with more information soon. And if you want, um, you can leave us your suggestions for topics related to more plant-based diets in Europe in the short survey that will show up in your browser after this um, session. Um, so this brings our very, very interesting and informative session to an end. And I thank you all panelists and guests for joining us um, and hopefully see you all again in November time, if not before. So thank you very much.